Hello again, and thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Colin Robertson. I'm Senior VP with Metrosense, and it's a pleasure to be able to host this webinar with Tobias Gilk, focused on the new VA MRI design guidelines. If any of you don't know Metrosense, we're the leading provider of advanced magnetic detection technologies. Our Ferroguard ferromagnetic detection systems are protecting patients and staff now in 36 countries around the world. Before handing over to Toby, and especially for those of you who this is your first Metrosense webinar, I've got just a few housekeeping items to cover to make sure we all get the most out of our time together today. Firstly, today's session will be available on demand after we finish. Just follow the same link as used just now, and we'll also send this to you in the email a few hours after the session. Of course, please feel free to share this with any of your colleagues who are unable to attend today. I'll now quickly take you through the various parts of the screen in front of you. Starting on the left side is a Q&A window. I'm sure you have many questions for Toby today, so please do enter them here as early as you can. The window in the center of the screen is where you'll see the slides throughout the webinar. If you'd like to change the sizes of any of the windows, just use the controls at the top right corner of each window. To hide or redisplay any of the individual windows, just use the buttons at the base of the screen. At top right, we're pleased to provide you with a number of links to MRI safety resources. You'll find a link here to the Metrosense MRI Safety Resource Center, where you can also access on-demand versions of all of our previous webinars, our new MRI Safety Talks podcast series, and other MRI safety content. Do go and have a look. Now, I know many of you will be looking to obtain an attendance certificate for this webinar. The yellow button highlighted here will enable you to download your certificate. You need to have watched the webinar, though, for a minimum of 40 minutes before doing so. You can download and print at the end of the webinar, and there will also be a link in the email that you'll receive a few hours after we close. The final window, lower right, gives you a brief biography of Tobias Gilk, our speaker today. Toby's an architect specializing in the design of radiology facilities, and indeed is one of the main authors of the design guide we are discussing today. Since becoming involved in the area of MR safety, He's contributed to many of the key initiatives to move practice forward, including being a named co-author to the 2020 edition of the ACR Manual on MR Safety. He's certified as an MR Safety Officer and MR Safety Expert by the American Board of MR Safety and indeed is a previous chair of the ABMRS. Toby is, of course, also one of the most widely published and quoted experts in the MR Safety field, and Metrosense is proud to have him as a consultant to the company. Lots to cover in today's session, so let me now hand over to Toby. Hello, and welcome to Plan Your Next MRI Project Safely with the new VA Design Guide. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to make the physical design of MRI safety facilities a priority for you. And with that, let's get rolling. As Colin mentioned, uh, my name is Tobias Gilk. I will be your presenter today. Um, a little bit about me so that you know <laughs> who's talking to you, where they're coming from. Um, I am, uh, I've been involved in MRI safety for about 20 years now. Um, I am an architect by training, um, so my entree into MRI safety actually came from uh, the physical environment parts of, of MR, um, and it's metastasized to much more than that, but um, my, my roots are those of an architect. Um, I am an architect with the uh, firm Radiology Planning, or RAD Planning, um, and I really ought to give a shout out to them uh, for making it possible for, for me to do this uh, presentation. Um, I am in addition to that sort of architectural background, my more MR safety related background, I am a founding board member of the American Board of Magnetic Resonance Safety. I am a special consultant to the ACR um, and their MRI Safety Committee. Um, the founder of my own consultancy, Gilk Radiology Consultants, um, and through GRC, Gilk Radiology Consultants, I provide ongoing consulting services to Metrosense. And not on this slide, but perhaps the single most relevant piece is that um, I, 
through radiology planning, um, and probably the principal author of much of what you will find in the new VA design guide for imaging services. Now, because of my role with the American Board of Magnetic Resonance Safety, uh, when I give presentations on MRI safety topics, um, I include this disclaimer, disclosure, um, and that is that because ABMRS does certification exams based on MRI safety knowledge, um, I want to make sure it's explicitly clear that the, this lecture, this presentation, uh, will not include um, any information specific to ABMRS examinations. So with that, let's, let's get into our content, shall we? So if the, the news that the VA has a design guide for imaging services is new to you, um, this is a great opportunity to point out sort of the, the incredible resource that, uh, resources that the VA makes available for health care design, hospital design in particular, um, the VA publishes free facility planning resources. Um, now, these include space planning criteria. Um, if you know what functions you want, um, the space planning criteria can help identify for you the specific spaces and the specific size of those spaces and the ratios at which you program those spaces to ultimately come up with a sort of an overall facility program. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with planner speak, um, a program is essentially the, the, the grocery list, the shopping list of spaces and functions. Um, now, there are the things that we always remember when we're going to the grocery store, bread and milk. Um, but we may forget that we need, you know, trash bags or, you know, dishwasher detergent, or those sorts of things that are um, necessary, but, but they tend not to be the reason we're going to the grocery store. Um, space planning criteria, when it's done well, identifies not only the, the top line, you know, headline kind of thing, but also the supporting roles, uh, and it helps to make sure that we plan facilities effectively for operations. In addition to space planning, there is equipment planning, um, and equipment planning is exactly what it sounds like, a listing of the equipment, the materiel that you need in addition to the box that is the room um, to be able to perform the function of the room. And the third one, the design guide, we're going to go into some detail about that one. But before we get into detail about what the design guide is or what it contains, um, I want to make sure that everybody is also aware that in addition to design resources from the VA that are particular to individual areas within the hospital, the healthcare institution, there are also broad design guides uh, for um, HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, design, planning and design with particular HVAC design criteria for different parts of the building. Same thing for electrical design, finishes, seismic. Um, it, again, if you haven't previously stumbled across the, the VA technical information library, um, you, it's worth a look, if only just to see the, the depth and breadth of resources that they make available there. All right, so the reason you're all here the Imaging Services Design Guide. Um, for those of you who may have seen previous versions of the design guide, um, what is now today, as of 2020, the Imaging Services Design Guide was in years prior, um, multiple different design guides, uh, separate design guides. There used to be one for radiology that dealt with X-ray, rad, fluoro, CT, mammo, ultrasound, um, essentially all of the ionizing uh, radiation modalities plus ultrasound. Um, there was a separate nuclear medicine design guide, uh, and that included SPECT and PET and uh, thyroid probe. Um, and there was the MRI design guide. Now, even though the new Imaging Service Design Guide covers all three of those areas in a single unified document, we're actually going to spend this time 
focusing on the MRI component within the new 2020 Imaging Services Design Guide. And we'll delve into some of the resources and material um, specific to MRI within this new design guide. Um, for those of you who have responsibilities for other things in imaging services besides MRI, um, please just take this as an indication of the types of resources that you'll find for other modalities. But MRI, because it's the most complicated um, in terms of siting and physical environment safety um, in many respects, um, this is the one that probably has the single most attention in the design guide um, by a single modality. And it's why we're here today. So let's talk MRI. There are a number of different components within the design guide, um, and one of them is narrative guidance. Essentially, the document provides a how-to guide, uh, uh, instruction set, or if not explicit instructions, at least uh, identifies design considerations that facility planners and designers and end users really should identify to make sure that they understand and can communicate back and forth between planners and architects and engineers and end users um, so that everybody's on the same page about what is expected or desired. We're going to go through some of the MRI-specific narrative guidance, and we're going to talk about support spaces and the VA's MRI safety directive, acuity classifications, zones, the use of tether anchors and conjunction, in conjunction, waveguides, um, as well as narrative information for those who may not really feel comfortable with identifying the different types of shielding involved in MRI installations. Let's take these one at a time. So the first of these is support spaces. Um, now, uh, I can build for you the most fantabulous MRI room in the world, um, but if we don't actually have spaces planned to prepare the patients for the MRI study, um, the most fantabulous MRI room in the world is going to suffer from um, really poor capacity, throughput uh, capability. So it's not only the MRI scanner in the room that it sits in, but an effective and efficiently designed MRI suite also includes the support spaces, support for patient care and for staff. Now, not in the design guide document, but forthcoming in a parallel document, the space planning criteria associated with imaging services. Um, now, my best understanding, and I looked just a couple days ago, this is not yet up on the VA's website, um, and the information I'm presenting to you is draft information, but this gives you an idea of the algorithms that are used to drive uh, support spaces. So if we know that we have a one MRI scanner room, then we know that we should be providing a minimum of two patient dressing rooms um, and one personal property locker location. They call them an alcove, but you just want to make sure you have a spot for lockers. Um, patient waiting, sub waiting, uh, essentially is what that is. Each of these support space elements um, is developed and provided in a specific algorithmic rate to make sure that we have appropriate support space based on the number of MRIs and the function um, that's being employed. Um, this is incredibly important to focus not exclusively on the, the million dollar piece of equipment, um, but also to focus on the, the smaller, less expensive, no fancy doodads types of spaces because they are vitally important to effective and efficient MRI operations. And that's true not just for MRI, um, but for all imaging modalities. It's also really important to recognize that the VA itself has MRI safety rules 
apart from the design guide and VA specific rules that are apart from the ACR or the Joint Commission or other outside entities. Um, in 2018, they published the MRI Safety Directive. And if you want to look it up, it's 1105.05. Um, uh, and it essentially describes operations and staffing and training and physical environment safety parameters for uh, MRI facilities. Um, if you are planning, developing, designing VA facilities, this is an absolute must. This is not you know, a polite suggestion. This is thou shalt. Um, if you are designing, planning, operating an MRI facility outside of the VA system, I would still very strongly recommend that you look this up because it is a potent resource for effective MRI safety. Also in the new 2020 um, Imaging Services Design Guide is an acuity intervention rating system. Um, essentially, there are three classes, class one, class two, class three. And these correspond pretty directly with exam, procedure, and surgical environment. Let's, let's take a look at it in what I think is a little bit more user-friendly format. Here's the table or matrix that correlates the, the classification, again, diagnostic, interventional, more surgical, interoperative, with um, different aspects of patient acuity or level of patient support or level of intervention that are appropriate to different levels of care. Um, essentially, you pick the, the most extreme uh, acuity sedation or intervention level um, that you reasonably anticipate uh, being a regular occurrence in that environment. And then you pick the, the classification or you are assigned really the classification based on that highest level of care. And the classification drives different elements of the design. So essentially, from a planning or design standpoint, the more the higher the level of acuity, the greater the level of intervention, the more we want to make sure is provided at the point of care to appropriately support that type of patient care. And of course, the new imaging services design guide also goes into detail about the MRI zones. This particular map actually is originally published in the VA's MRI Safety Directive, um, and it is republished and referenced in the new Imaging Services Design Guide. Um, there's lots of information about zones elsewhere. We won't spend much time on it, but just know that this as a resource is available to you there. Now, unlike the zones, which we have information about everywhere, tether anchors is something uh, that is, I think, for the first time, really explicitly called out in this um, imaging services design guide um, and the highlighted text that scanner rooms must include anchoring tether points within either the casework or in the wall slash floor. This provides a mechanism to tie off the movement of portable equipment from exceeding the allowable exposures identified by the equipment manufacturer. Essentially, MR conditional equipment frequently has conditions that say don't expose this to a magnetic field stronger than X or a magnetic spatial gradient greater than Y. Um, now, that's a physical bubble of space um, that is not visually identifiable. Maybe we put tape marks on the floor or something like that. But if we have portable equipment that has limitations um, then the VA says we want to make sure that we include tether points that allow us to prevent a mobile piece of equipment from getting too close to the MRI, to exceeding those allowable conditions. Similarly and related, um, the design guide talks about waveguides. Now, waveguides are special types of penetrations because the MRI room is a six-sided shielded box, um, and we really can't have openings in that six-sided box unless they're specifically designed to allow equipment or cables or pump lines or whatever, IV lines, to go in and effectively prevent radiofrequency interference. Um, so 
here we're talking about the, the design guide provides specific instructions on making sure that we provide waveguides that are appropriate to the level of clinical care and the equipment that will be present um, in this MR environment. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, the design guide also helps us better understand the shielding types, the different shielding needs or potential needs of an MRI facility. Um, this includes an explanation of how the, the default shield for MRI rooms, the, the radio frequency or RF shielding, how it works, and in fact, how it's different than many of our popular understandings of shielding in the radiology environment. Um, and it describes the, the function and the distinction as compared to passive magnetic shielding. Um, so the RF shielding is essentially default. We need that for pretty much every clinical MRI system. Passive magnetic shielding, on the other hand, is only required in some situations. And depending on how we lay out the facility, um, this is one of those areas where the planner, the designer, the, the person who's organizing the space may be able to use the arrangement and configuration of the space to reduce or hopefully even eliminate the need for passive magnetic shielding. Um, passive magnetic shielding actually serves kind of a similar function to what we think of shielding doing in pretty much every other nuclear medicine radiology environment. Um, it's designed to pr protect, prevent interference outside the imaging room. Um, now, it works on a different principle, um, but we can think of it in terms analogous to X-ray shielding or lead shielding. Um, and it's really important to understand that this type of shielding, this element of the shielding, the passive magnetic shielding, um, may or may not be required. And this is one of the areas where the designer um, can play a really important role in reducing the need for or eliminating the need for passive magnetic shielding, which saves quite a bit of money and complication. Now, here's where things get more fun for me. The, the MRI design guidance, uh, not to, to throw stones at the narrative guidance um, because I think it's really helpful, um, but the design guidance, I think, from a, a facility safety standpoint, um, this, this is where the exciting stuff is. So we're going to talk a little bit about each quench and quench safety, thickened entry, um, and its correlate, the use of ferromagnetic detection systems. And we're going to talk about door swings going into the MRI room. So the first of the design guidance that we're going to touch on is quench pipe design and quench pipe discharge points. Um, the image on the left is showing how if you take the quench pipe and you come up through the roof and you simply turn it 90 degrees and put a 45 degree chamfer on the end of the pipe, um, this was and perhaps still is a standard detail of one of the MRI manufacturers. Um, it really only takes a wind speed of about 25 miles an hour to essentially push rain, push precipitation into the mouth of that quench pipe. Um, and that's bad. You don't want that to happen. Um, what you want instead is a weather head type of quench pipe. Um, the diagram on the right hand side is one version of this, the candy cane hook. Um, the illustration on the right shows how you protect the roofing material uh, with a sacrificial layer um, um, to make sure that if you have a quench, it doesn't destroy your roof. Because the last thing you want after your magnet quenches is for your roof to start leaking on top of your magnet. Um, so providing appropriate protections for the roof as well um, as a part of your overall comprehensive um, quench pipe discharge protections. And here we're showing a thickened entry at the magnet room. Um, now, the goal of the thickened entry is to essentially 
move or push away moving objects that may have ferromagnetic material, including RF doors. Uh, now, we're so careful about making sure that we exclude ferromagnetic material from inside the, the MRI scanner room. We might reasonably assume that the shielded doors for MRI rooms are non-ferromagnetic, but that's not the case. Um, now, the moving door um, has the potential of creating interference with a ferromagnetic detection system. Um, and with the physics of magnetism, short increases in distance um, can dramatically reduce the potential for interference. So by thickening the wall around the MRI room door and extending that thickening off to the side, we move the ferromagnetic detection systems away from the doorway or from the door, the swinging door, and with that thickened piece essentially pushing the observation window away from the door, we can also move the operator's console a few feet away from the door. Both of these, the distance from the swinging door and the distance from the tech who is going to be, you know, rolling around in the office chair at the console, those separation distances reduce the potential for um, false positives. Um, they're not technically false positives. It's a ferromagnetic detector. It's there to detect ferromagnetic material, so it's doing what it's supposed to. Um, but it improves the functionality, it improves the effective discrimination um, with a ferromagnetic detection system. So this thickened entry system um, is now a strong design recommendation for MRI sites. And those thickened entries are in support of, as I said, ferromagnetic detection system. Um, now, <laughs> The, the thickened entry uh, design element is new to the design guide, um, and since it was just published three weeks ago, thereabouts, plus or minus, from when I'm recording this, um, it hasn't had an opportunity to really be deployed at a mass scale. So the picture you're looking at right now doesn't include the thickened entry. Um, but uh, this as sort of a general arrangement of ferromagnetic detection at the magnet room doorway. Um, and you can see the proximity between the detector and the radio frequency door, the shielded door into the MRI room. Um, and so this is all part of what we're trying to get to um, to improve the with facility design and construction, improve the site's ability to use ferromagnetic detection system as an effective discriminating tool to alert on patients and objects and materiel that's about to go in the magnet room um, and reduce potential interference or uh, false signals from the magnet room door or the technologist at the console. So that's what this is all about at the direction of the door swing. Um, now, I talked about the thickened entry. I talked about the ferromagnetic detection systems at the entry door. Now I'm talking about the direction of swing of the door. So clearly, this region of an MRI suite, the interface between zone three and zone four, has a lot going on. Um, and it's really important that we appropriately include the design elements in this super compact area where we have, as I say, a lot going on. Um, that being said, I probably owe you, I probably owe all of the design world an apology um, because I was probably the most vocal proponent for outward swinging doors 20, 25 years ago. Um, now, in my defense, at the time, most radio frequency doors never latched. They didn't, there wasn't a click when the door closed. You actually had to kind of shoulder check the door to get it to squeeze shut in the door frame, and it was just sort of a friction fit. When radio frequency doors did not have latches, then a pressure buildup, if the door was out swinging, the pressure buildup would essentially push the door open. Now, uh, hospital codes and standards have changed, and it is problematic, to say the least, um, to have non-latching doors in a lot of areas in the hospital. Um, 
So we very rarely actually see the same type of friction fit door in hospital environments anymore. We now see latches in radio frequency doors. When the latch becomes an integral part of the RF door, then the outward swinging function um, from pressure increases because of a quench inside the magnet room, that pressure relief function ceases to work um, with the door. And now it becomes vitally important that we have passive pressure relief systems built into the ductwork and HVAC for the room. And once we do that, then it really doesn't matter what direction we swing the door from a uh, quench safety standpoint. Um, so my recommendation is that we swing the door into the magnet room um, and we provide appropriate quench protection, passive pressure relief elsewhere. Um, this in some ways kind of simplifies the, the layout. It makes it easier to make sure that the technologist has direct line of sight to the approach to the magnet room door because we don't have the potential of the, the open door blocking part of the view. Um, it also simplifies the installation of ferromagnetic detection systems. So for all of those reasons and more, um, for new MRI facilities, build passive pressure relief into your HVAC system and swing the door whatever way you want. My suggestion is you swing it into the magnet room as shown. Now, in the last few minutes that we have together, I'm going to take you on a speed dating tour of the VA design templates for the MRI rooms. Um, now, the templates that are provided in the VA's Imaging Services Design Guide, um, they, for all of the modalities, they include the, the scanning room, uh, control room, and equipment or system component room as appropriate. Um, now, ultrasound, we don't have system component rooms and we don't have separate control areas, but you get the picture. For CT, MRI, PET, SPECT, um, we include the, the, the imaging modality room, the control space, and the equipment or system component room. And here's what the MRI triad, um, so from the left to the right, system component room, scanning room, uh, control room. Um, this is what that triad will look like in the imaging services design guide. Um, a few things uh, to be aware of here. Um, number one, this is the class one, or essentially the, the diagnostic only version of this room. In addition to this, there is a class two version that is the version that would better, more appropriately support um, interventional care, high acuity care, that kind of thing. Um, of note, these designs, particularly for the, the big iron types of, of scanners, CT, MRI, um, these are based on uh, what we've termed worst of breed. Um, so we've picked the fattest, the tallest, the thickest, the longest table, the longest back table extension of every, not every, but many of the, the most popular MRs on the market. And the template that you're seeing on the screen for the MRI scanner itself essentially takes those um, you know, worst case dimensions of pretty much every scanner, uh, I mean, yeah, not every, many popular scanners, um, and built a thickest, fattest, tallest, longest uh, version of that. Similarly, the five gauss line around that um, is a worst case five gauss line based on 3T um, MR scanners. So your 1.5s, your 3Ts, whether they are Siemens, GE, Philips, Canon, whoever, um, the Bohr format horizontal field magnets, um, you should be able to, using this template and the dimensions provided in it, um, you should be able to cite pretty much any magnet um, and know that the room is appropriately sized to accommodate any of them. Um, again, this is based on 1.5 and 3T systems. Similarly, you'll see uh, the dashed red line, the five gauss line, and you see how it on the left-hand side projects into the system component room. Um, well, this is, goes back to what I was saying earlier about shielding, that if we effectively plan and lay out the facility 
so that the system component room essentially occupies the space where we would have five gas projection into adjacent spaces, then we can reduce or eliminate the need for passive magnetic shielding. So this is it. This is the, the plan, the floor plan, the bird's eye view, the coronal view of this triad. But one thing that I think makes architects and radiologists and, and rad techs good partners for a conversation is visual imagery, visual perception, right? So um, some people have a hard time with that previous version, the, the two-dimensional plan. So the design guide also includes these three-dimensional, uh, the technical name is axonometric drawings. Um, but it shows you the layout, the composition, the arrangement of the spaces three-dimensionally, um, which I think helps all of us better understand, better perceive um, how these spaces actually lay out and actually work. Um, so in the templates, uh, when you get into them, so the MRI templates will include the plan. They will include what's called a reflected ceiling plan. So if the plan is you floating above with a coronal view looking, you know, down into the, the room, um, a reflected ceiling plan is the reverse of that. It's you laying on the floor staring up at the ceiling, and it shows you the layout of medical gas drops coming out of the ceiling and positions of your emergency exhaust for your, or your passive pressure relief for your MRI room, um, lights and that sort of thing. Um, so we have the floor plan, we have the reflected ceiling plan, we have interior elevations. So if we stood and we faced each wall in the, the model, in the layout, um, and we could see exactly what is on each wall, um, including all of the equipment and everything is labeled and identified. And then we have these axonometric three-dimensional views that allow us to really stitch all of that two-dimensional information together into something that I believe is more holistic and, and better comprehended, certainly by myself, but I think, um, I think I'm not alone in that. Not only does it give you that sort of static view into the three-dimensional model, the coolest thing, there are actually these 3D PDFs inside the document. It allows you to do this to the model. And you can rotate it and zoom in and zoom out, and you can, if you want to, put yourself in the position of the tack looking through the window at the scanner. Um, all of this inside the document. So one of the things about the VA design templates in the Imaging Services Design Guide is, as we've seen, they just include the magnet room control room and system component room. Um, now, the, the design guide and its accompanying resources give you the information for identifying the spaces that you may need for changing rooms and subweighting and patient lockers and um, staff toilets and patient toilets and inpatient holding zone. And you get that information in a ratio, right? Um, but it doesn't show it to you graphically in these models. Um, so you're really kind of left with this, this core, right? The, the, the triumvirate, the system component room, the scan room, the control room, and then a shopping list of these other spaces that you need to provide, but it doesn't give it to you kind of all as one, does it? Which makes me really excited to share with you the fact that Metrosense is actually developing the tool that isn't in the VA Imaging Services Design Guide, at least the tool for MRI. And that is prototypical suite layouts, um, essentially taking the program information for many of the supporting spaces, um, waiting areas, changing rooms, um, IV start, medication prep, inpatient holding, patient toilets, staff toilets, um, taking all of these that algorithmically defined supporting spaces that are really necessary to an effective and efficiently operating MRI suite. And it provides it to you in an overall suite layout, similar to the, the 
sort of core diagrams and models um, that I just showed you um, that showed just the system component, scanning room, control room. This will be that same level of informational detail, um, but it will include the, the overall suite. Now, the expectation, if not, that this is copy and paste, that designers simply take um, these prototypes for um, MRI suites out of the Metrosense models and drop them into the drawings. But it is a, an effective point of departure. Um, it includes the provision of the supporting spaces in the appropriate ratios per the VA algorithms. Um, and it prompts discussions about uh, what spaces and functions are really appropriate. It will illustrate the four zone layouts. That's another thing that's really not in these sort of core diagrams is we don't really understand the relationship between the, the different zones and, and where and how we provide access controls. But the new models and the, the companion descriptive pieces that will be coming out with this um, will provide uh, an, an additional level of richness of information uh, for everybody. And by virtue of the fact that you have signed up for and are participating in this webinar, we will let you know as soon as that additional resource is available. And in fact, we're talking about having another webinar where we delve into the, the particular utility of that new tool uh, for you, for everybody, uh, in terms of planning MRI facilities. Now, I, I've, I've purposely constructed this webinar to try and allow for a generous amount of time for your questions. Um, if you have not yet done so, um, please enter any questions you have into the chat box, the dialogue, um, and we'll answer as many of those questions as we have time for. Um, anything related to MRI facility planning design um, and, and its influence on safety, um, anything about the VA design guide or other design resources, um, any of those are fair game for your questions. And while you're formatting your questions, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your time and your energy and your attention and for making MRI safety a priority in the planning development design of your next radiology MRI project. Thank you very much. Um, I would be remiss if I failed to take this opportunity to also thank uh, RAD Planning, Radiology Planning, um, both for all of the design work development that went into the VA's Imaging Services Design Guide, um, as well as making it possible for me to, to share this information with you. Uh, I'd like to thank the VA for making not only the Imaging Services Design Guide, but so many of the collateral resources um, publicly available, freely shared. Um, and again, if you haven't previously explored, I would encourage you to do so. Um, a number of really great resources. Um, and lastly, I would very much like to thank Metrosense, as always, uh, for making this webinar and so many webinars available um, on MRI safety and best practices. Um, if you're interested in MRI safety above and beyond just this MRI VA design guide resource, um, I would encourage you to take a look at the Metrosense resources webpage. Um, there's tons and tons and tons, webcasts, podcasts, white papers, other resources uh, for your viewing and listening pleasure. Um, and lastly, uh, thank you, Colin, for emceeing this. And I'll turn it over to you for time we have for questions. Many thanks, Toby. Valuable and insightful as ever. Before we move on to the Q&A, I just want to point out one more button on your screen that I didn't mention earlier. Um, at the right-hand end of the bar at the base of your screen is a button you can press if you'd like to get more information on Metrosense MRI safety systems. Uh, in the new normal we're all living with now, we're running regular virtual product demos online. 
And so it's a very simple way to learn more about state-of-the-art FMDS safety systems. So if you're interested, click through, send me an email, and we'll set something up. So as expected, we've had many more many questions over the past 45 minutes. So let's see how many we can answer now. Um, and we're going to start, first of all, with this one. Um, so the question is, how did the VA become the standards for MRI safety, such as this planning guide, um, and also being mentioned in the ACR manual on MRI safety? Um, well, the, the VA as a system has the MRI safety directive, and to the best of my knowledge, they're the only healthcare system that actually has a, a, an MRI safety specific set of mandates um, internal to their system. Um, they, the, the fact that they have done that doesn't automatically make that applicable to other systems and other hospitals or healthcare providers. Um, with respect to the ACR and their reference to, to the VA, um, the ACR, formerly um, guidance document on MR safe practices, now manual on MR safety, um, it is essentially a an amalgamation of best practices, the vast majority of which the um, ACR has developed themselves. However, um, with their specific citation of the VA's MRI safety directive, um, they're, they're consolidating in one place. It's not that the, the VA has some sort of magical authority over ACR or best practice. It's that the ACR saw that the VA had done this um, and recognized it and attributed specific staffing um, minimums, um, attributed that best practice requirement back to the VA. So I hope that resolves that question. Great. Thank you, Toby. Uh, right, we've had a couple of questions about tether points. So the first of those is, are the tether points protect the mobile equipment from the gas lines, or are the tether points keep the mobile equipment from injuring staff and or patients? Short answer to that question is yes. Um, they're, they're intended to be able to, to pro provide benefits to both of those, protecting the operation of the equipment. So an MR conditional, say, vent um, or anesthesia machine is only guaranteed to operate correctly if you keep the exposure to static magnetic field or magnetic spatial gradient, keep it at or below the threshold value. If you exceed the threshold value, the manufacturer no longer guarantees that that piece of equipment functions correctly. So one of the two goals is to keep it functioning the way that it's supposed to. The second of which is um, many pieces of equipment that have MR conditional ratings um, can indeed become projectiles if they get too close and could do harm to patients or caregivers. So the tethers serve both purposes, assuring consistent uniform operation of the MR conditional device and protecting MR conditional devices that may have the potential to go flying from going flying. Great stuff. Thank you. And uh, on the same subject, can you describe how equipment can be tethered to casework? Yeah, um, and, and that's a great question. Um, the challenge, and this is true both for tethering to casework or tethering to a wall or a floor, is that if the facility was not designed or built with the, the notion of tethering, um, it may be difficult to retrofit this kind of application to an existing um, construction. Um, first off, it, drilling into the floor or into the wall uh, runs the risk of penetrating the RF shield, um, which is very bad business. Um, it may be possible to implement tethers either at the floor or in the wall, um, but if you do so in a retrofit kind of way, um, I would strongly, strongly urge you to coordinate this with your RF shield vendor um, to make sure that we're not damaging the shield. Specifically to the question about casework, um, uh, we may be able to essentially put um, 
either holes in the casework that we can thread like a strap or you know the tether through, um, or we may be able to mount or bolt um, uh, an anchor eye that we can attach a tether to um, to the casework. Um, now, depending on how the casework is built inside the MRI room, um, it may or may not really have been designed in anticipation of a potential force that might be pulling on it, you know, pulling the countertop, trying to pull it off of the, the base cabinets, for example. Um, and again, in a retrofit situation, um, I would strongly encourage you to look carefully um, and you may want to consider having um, professional designer identify ways that existing casework, if you are indeed retrofitting some sort of anchor point, um, ways in which existing casework either meets the demands, these new demands that are being placed on it, or can cost and time effectively be modified um, to make sure that it is you know, suitably strong uh, to, to act as a tether point. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to put one more question in on, on this subject, if I may. Um, in lieu of tether points, what is best practice to alert staff of conditional limits or locations for the equipment relative to the gas lines? So if you're not tethering, so, how do you tell people? Yeah. I, well, this would be whether you are tethering or not. I would very strongly encourage um, boundary conditions for um, critical MR conditional equipment, such as a ventilator or an anesthesia machine. I mean, we're, if we're doing ventilated patients, we're not doing it without a vent. Um, so in that instance, it becomes a critical piece of you know, life-saving equipment. Um, so we need to have it in the room. If it has an MR conditional label for, with a condition for static field strength or magnetic spatial gradient, I believe that it is wise and appropriate to have a demarcation line on the floor of your magnet room that shows the operator the point at which, you know, if you go beyond this line or beyond this series of points, you will likely exceed the, the conditions of this device. Um, that can get difficult if you have um, an anesthesia machine that has one rating, a ventilator that has a different rating, a patient vitals monitor that has a different rating, and an infusion pump that has a different rating, a power injector that has a different rating, um, in which case maybe you need to find the most um, restrictive limitation that would apply to multiple pieces of equipment and mark that line on the floor instead of having six separate and more conditional lines. Um, but I would strongly recommend having a visual line of demarcation on the floor. I believe that tethers um, are a very helpful augment to the, the line um, because there are instances, particularly because most of the equipment that we're bringing into and out of the room is on wheels, right? If we park it just outside of the line and inadvertently bump it, um, we may send it across the line and it may go the rest of the way on its own depending on the piece of equipment. Um, so having the line of demarcation so there's a visual reference, but then having the tethers, if you're able to do that, um, is you know, belt and suspenders extra safe. Um, and it helps reduce the potential for human error, um, which is where the vast, vast, vast majority of MRI, MRI accidents occur. Um, if we know that we are just physically incapable of bringing this piece of equipment too close to the magnet. Thanks, Debbie. Um, we had a number of questions on door swing. Um, we had a question about uh, is the what the legislation is um, that covers the requirement for scan room doors to open outwards, and then a couple of questions on um, if the scan room opens inwards, isn't there a risk to the patient during the quench? So I think it might be worth clarifying again on that. Sure, yeah, and, and my apologies if I didn't give enough detail in, in the body of, of the webinar. Um, so 
there is a healthcare design standard. Uh, we can call it sort of a, a building code. Um, technically, that's not what it is, but it functions like a building code. Um, it's called FGI, Facilities Guidelines Institute, Guidelines for the Design of Healthcare Facilities. Um, in, in this code, um, it describes the ways in which you're supposed to design, plan, build different parts of a hospital or healthcare enterprise. Um, it used to say for MRI facilities that the, the door was supposed to swing out. Um, now, the reason for the outward swinging door requirement many, many moons ago um, is if the magnet quenches, a superconducting MRI quenches and releases helium gas into the room, that helium gas is expanding dramatically, right? So if you imagine we have a sealed up box and we put uh, helium gas that's expanding into that box, it will pressurize, it will try and inflate the box. If the door into that box swings into the box, right, then the pressure uh, inside the box, this increased pressure, is pushing the door closed, and it wants to keep it closed. So the room is more and more likely to pressurize. If the door swings outward, in theory, um, if the room pressurizes, then the pressure just pushes the door open and the pressure escapes and we no longer have a pressurized room. Um, so the risk comes about if the door is closed, the magnet quenches, the room pressurizes, and it pushed the door closed, and there's a patient inside, how is anybody going to get that patient out? That was the rationale, the logic 20, 25 years ago. Um, the reason for that was at the time, the vast, vast majority of radio frequency shielded doors for MRI never latched. Um, you had to like slam the door shut and it kind of friction fit into the door frame. It didn't actually, there was not a lever or a latch. It didn't click when you closed it. It just sort of was held in place by the friction between the door and the door frame. And when that was the case, yes, an overpressurized room would, in fact, push the door open um, and it would release the pressure. Changes in life safety and, and hospital building code standards made it, uh, over time, much more difficult and problematic to put a door in that doesn't have a latch. Think about this in your daily life. How many doors do you pass through in a hospital or healthcare enterprise that just that, that don't latch? I mean, there's usually a sliding door at the front entrance of the hospital, but beyond that, you probably every other door in the hospital latches. Um, and the same forces that have all the other doors latching have um, RF doors, um, MRI entry room doors latching. When the door latches, positive pressurization um, essentially um, pins the door shut no matter which way it swings. Um, if you want to look up on YouTube the prank how to penny in somebody's door, um, that essentially describes the physical phenomena as to what prevents the door latch from retracting and keeps the door pinned um, even if it swings outward. So if the presence of the latch essentially means that um, the door swing in an outward direction isn't the, the safety feature it used to be before we had latches, um, then we need to make sure that that safety feature is accomplished through another mechanism, a passive pressure relief duct. Once you have a passive pressure relief duct, now, all of a sudden, we're not depending on the door to provide this safety mechanism. We've provided that through an, another means, which means now we can swing the door whichever way we please. And my recommendation in light of the, those changes is have a passive pre pressure relief mechanism in your magnet room and swing the door into the magnet room. It avoids potential blockage of lines of sight, makes it easier to cite ferromagnetic detection systems, um, and generally speaking, and there are always exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, swinging the magnet room 
door into the MRI scan room, the magnet room, um, is the easiest, most straightforward solution. So I hope I clarified some of what I may have gone over too quickly in, in the body of the webinar. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. Um, I think we just could maybe time for a couple more. Um, so what about having a mesh over the chamfered quench pipe lock out debris from wind? Um, uh, so the mesh serves the purpose of keeping debris out, uh, nesting birds or insects or what have you. Um, and absolutely, you need to have some sort of mesh or grill um, at the quench pipe discharge. However, um, a mesh that's going to keep a bird out is probably not going to keep wind-driven rain out. We're interested not only in keeping out debris, but we're also interested in keeping out precipitation uh, because water that enters the quench pipe will flow downhill. And if you have a rooftop quench vent, the thing that is most downhill from that entry point is the rupture disc um, for your magnet. And if water accumulates on the backside, the exterior side of your burst disc, and for some reason freezes solid, um, now you have an obstruction even though you didn't have quote unquote debris entering the quench pipe. Um, for many systems, it takes about a half liter of water um, accumulated in the quench pipe to um, occlude the, the rupture disc um, enough that you run the risk of a catastrophic quench uh, for the magnet. So the mesh is essential, um, but the mesh alone doesn't achieve the goal of preventing everything that we want to prevent from entering the quench pipe from entering the quench pipe. Thanks, Toby. Right, just one more then, and uh, I'm going to ask you to be very short and sweet on this one. Uh, is, the thickened en is the thickened entry wall construction the same conventional construction as the wall, or is it a, another construction material? It can be anything. It is, its purpose is to provide physical separation uh, between the, where we place the ferromagnetic detectors and the radio frequency door. And then the width of it is meant to provide physical separation from ferromagnetic detectors at the entry to the magnet room and where the console is and presumably the technologist or radiographer moving about at the console. Its sole purpose, the thickened entry's sole purpose is to keep moving metal objects that we know are near the ferromagnetic detector just a shorter distance away. Um, and that little increase in distance can have a pretty significant impact on um, you know, how much more reliable and operational usage of ferromagnetic detection is. So um, it, can be, it can be conventional wall material. You could make it out of cabinetry. It could be sculptural for all I care. Um, the, the goal is not, or the, the, the most important thing is not what it's made from, um, the most important thing is that it provides this relatively modest buffer space between the location of the ferromagnetic detector and moving metal objects that typically live near it. Perfect. Thank you very much. We can run a competition on the thickened wall sculpture in future. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we've reached the end of our time, and we do need to bring the webinar to a close now. Um, so just a usual couple of reminders from me. Firstly, for those of you who are looking to download a certificate of attendance, um, and I have to say there, there are no um, DEU credits, unfortunately, available for this webinar, but if you'd like a, a certificate of attendance, please click on the yellow certification button now. Um, alternatively, look out in the email that you'll receive, I think, in around four hours, which will provide you with a download link to that. Secondly, for those of your colleagues who are unable to attend our live session today, please do encourage them to join the on-demand the on-demand webinar, um, which will be available again in about four hours' time. Um, and of course, Metrosense has a full program of interesting webinars planned over the next few months, um, some of which will uh, involve uh, Mr. Gilp.
So please do look out for the invitations popping into your inbox. So it just leaves me then to say a thank you once again to our speaker, Toby Gilk, and to all of you online for joining us today. So until next time, thank you and stay well. Thanks a lot. Thank you.